thank you very much for the introduction. So I'm Katrina Waite, a clinical pharmacologist from Liverpool, but I spend most of my time in Uganda, where my main area of research is drug dosing and safety in pregnancy and breastfeeding. And today I'm going to start by emphasising just why it's so important that we study these drugs in these populations. I'll touch on study design, bring in some important clinical examples, and I'll conclude with a discussion of antiretrovirals in breastfeeding. So the first thing to say is that it is ethically imperative that we study drugs in the populations in whom they are to be used. And since at least 2005, regulators such as the FDA have said that if a drug is going to be widely used in women of childbearing potential, we must do pregnancy and lactation studies around the time of licensing. But unfortunately, that's rarely done. This picture shows one of our dolphin study participants, of course, taken with consent. She came to us with untreated HIV in the third trimester. And this is her about a year later after enrollment in the study with her HIV negative baby and the rest of her children, showing the community in which she lives. We need to bring our research right to the level of women like this who will benefit from our findings. It's also very complex to study these drugs because the female reproductive life cycle is complex. The different phases bring different risk and benefit considerations. And I know that Sharon will have just spoken on the first two parts of this schema. So by the time you get into second and third trimester, the main concerns are about dosing. So is the drug exposure still sufficient for the effect we want to achieve? And of course, we also have to know whether any drugs are associated with adverse birth outcomes. Many antiretrovirals are associated with slight low birth weight or slight preterm delivery, but that has to be offset against the risks of untreated HIV. When we move into breastfeeding, the issue is not just drug exposure, but also the fact that there is a residual risk of HIV transmission, even when the mother is virologically suppressed. And I'll come on to that towards the end of the talk. But what I want to do, firstly, is just stop and think about risk, because often when I tell people that this is my area of work, they ask me immediately, is that not awfully risky? Or sometimes, are you crazy? But I would like to argue that actually doing studies in this population is the most ethically correct and safest thing to do. So let, it, let me put it to you this way. The purple box represents the number of women with a condition who might benefit from the treatment. And the blue box represents the clinical trial. So what we've got here is a small number of women who've been carefully selected. We're following them closely. We have protocol specified endpoints. And at the first signal of any risk, we, we pause the study, we'd have a safety review committee. And if necessary, we could stop the trial and make a recommendation against using that drug. So the risk, it never quite goes away, but we keep it in a place where we can watch it carefully and measure it. Now, unfortunately, if you don't proactively do a trial in a drug that's gonna be used in women of childbearing age, pregnancies will occur. It's estimated that around the world about one in three pregnancies is unintended and that's more the case in regions with high fertility and low access to contraception. And what happens there is there's no real system to monitor them or follow them up. Clinicians recommending the drug aren't given any clear guidance on this. Women might present in late pregnancy Individual women have to choose about the drug and their health care, know when to seek attention. And basically, if there is a risk, by the time we notice it, it's far greater. And it may be the drug doesn't work in this population or it can be toxic. And that's not the only risk. If you force clinicians and women into a situation where they have to decide whether or not to use a drug off label in pregnancy, some of them quite reasonably are going to say no. And then they risk that they're perhaps on a less effective regimen, or in some conditions, they might risk the harms of untreated disease. So what you can see from this is that actually the ethically, the best and safest approach is to proactively do the studies, perhaps particularly those studies that seem riskiest. And I would argue this might apply to long acting drugs, for example. Indeed, doing studies in pregnancy and breastfeeding does map to all of the four conventional domains of bioethics. 
I'm showing this slide quite briefly, but it's in a paper that's coming out in BJCP that will be available online soon, possibly even by the time you hear this presentation. But back to pregnancy. You will remember that pregnancy affects all phases of absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination of a drug. And the precise changes will vary from drug to drug, but often the net effect is that the trough concentrations are lower and are reached earlier. And you'll remember that for antiretroviral drugs, that's of key importance because we need to maintain above a minimum concentration. So how should we do the studies? Well, I would say that just as there is an ethical imperative to do the work, there's an imperative to do it well so that the data is clear and the minimum number of patients are required to reach a conclusion. I would also plug for clinical pharmacology because sometimes the adult physicians care about the mother, the obstetricians focus on the pregnancy and the pediatricians focus on the baby. And we have to take a step back from that and see the whole picture. There have been several consensus statements written on this, and this one's adapted from a meeting that took place in 2019. It would be ideal to do an intensive pharmacokinetic profile in second and third trimester, although one of those time points might be sufficient. The only way we can actually understand how much drug crosses the placenta is to get paired cord and maternal blood samples at delivery. Now that sounds really awkward, but even in the dolphin study between Kampala and Cape Town, we were able to get those samples in about half of our participants and they yield very rich data. And then the best study design would be to bring the same mother back about six weeks postpartum. That time point is ideal because most of her physiology has returned to her non-pregnant state. So she acts as her own control. So when you compare the pharmacokinetic profiles between pregnancy and postpartum, the only difference should be that status of pregnancy. At six weeks, she's likely to be exclusively breastfeeding. And in a trial context, it's close enough that we shouldn't have lost her to follow up. And postpartum, we can measure not just her blood, but also the breast milk and the infant blood. And again, the consensus is that it's better to get richer data on a smaller number of patients rather than going straight for a very sparse study design. And I would urge you that if you are not the one who's going to be doing the pharmacometric analysis yourself, please involve the person who is in the study design stage, because there's nothing more frustrating than to get a data set and realize that just one or two differences in that design might have made a massive difference in the quality of the data. Despite this shift from protecting women from research to protecting them through research, and despite groups such as ourselves advocating for the earlier trials, there is still an unacceptable delay between drug licensing and availability of pregnancy data. And I'm going to talk about two of these drugs today. So I've already mentioned the Dolphin 1 study, and we wrote the protocol for this in 2012 prior to licensing of dolutegravir. The reason was we were seeing a lot of women with untreated HIV in third trimester. And at that time, the current best regimen we were using, efavirenz based, just didn't act quickly enough to get the viral load down by the time of delivery. And we've seen data from studies such as single, where the virological reduction was much more rapid. So we asked three questions. Firstly, was the 50 milligrams once daily dose sufficient in late pregnancy? Did we see the same rapid viral load reduction? And was it safe? So in terms of the pharmacokinetics, here's the concentration time profile with the pregnant women in red and the same women postpartum in blue. And you can see by the overlay of the two curves that there was no substantial difference and the dose was fine. And did it work? Yes, it did. This is the Kaplan-Meier curve of time to undetectability with the dolutegravir regimen in the solid line. Now, fascinatingly, this was a pilot study. We had not even powered for non-inferiority. And yet, with 30 women in each arm, we were able to show statistical superiority. Such was the difference. And as we got towards the end of Dolphin 1, we obtained funding for Dolphin 2, which was a much larger efficacy study with longer follow-up, more safety data, and the ability to do various qualitative and health economic studies alongside. You may have seen the virological final analysis, which was presented at CROI. And what it shows is that that superior viral suppression is maintained out to 72 weeks. The most significant differences between the two arms were as predicted earlier on. 
There were no significant differences in safety endpoints in either the mother or the infant. Now, it's worth remembering that these are high risk individuals by very nature of the population. And one of the first things somebody said to us when we started was, you are going to see some tragic cases. And indeed, that was the case, but none of it was to do with the drug or the trial. We saw three in utero transmissions on the dollar taker of your arm. Those mothers were fully suppressed by delivery. And we think it's just that they started antiretrovirals late in third trimester and the tri transmissions had probably already occurred. Sadly, we also saw one postpartum transmission through breastfeeding in the efavirenz arm. The mother did have a very small viral blip at 24 weeks to 126 copies. Whether that was the cause and it was an adherence issue or whether in fact it was one of those breakthrough transmissions that we believe occur, it's difficult to draw too much from a single case. So are there any regimens we shouldn't use in pregnancy? And yes, there are a few. And these are the ones that are boosted with cobicistat. So here's a paper from 2018. Now, please note this regimen combined was actually licensed in 2014 and pregnant women will have received it during the interim. These investigators did the PK curves in second and third trimester and postpartum. So the postpartum is represented by the open triangles at the top. So the first thing to note is that most of the pharmacokinetic changes are quite maximal by second trimester, which might be earlier than you expected. And you can see the significant reduction in area under the curve. But for antiretrovirals, it's the trough concentration that we worry about most. Because if you fall below that, you're in the zone where you risk viral failure or selection of resistant mutants. So this is significantly lower for both elvitegravir and also for cobicistat. We mustn't use that. A similar phenomenon is seen with cobicistat boosted darunavir. Very similar study design with three PK profiles and similar massive clinically significant reductions in drug exposure. Now, these authors also asked the question of whether perhaps the free or the active component of darunavir was maybe spared, but unfortunately not. We should not use cobicistat boosted regimens in pregnancy. And there's a clear biological reason for this. Cobicista acts on the 3A4 enzyme, which is strongly induced under the effect of progesterone, and that would explain the therapeutic failure of these drugs. So moving on to breastfeeding. The decisions about breastfeeding in HIV can be complex. There's quite a lot in favour of breastfeeding. For example, the more we understand about the benefits to both mother and infant, the more we understand that formula feeding is not without risk. And in the context of HIV, there are some quite interesting findings. For example, we know that HIV exposed but uninfected infants have certain immunological derangements. And these can be offset by the immune factors in the mother's breast milk, even when the mother is HIV positive. So in some situations, the HIV exposed infant might benefit more from breastfeeding than the infant of an HIV negative mother. We need more data on this. For many women, breastfeeding is the only social culturally acceptable choice. And I'll come back to that in a moment. And what we know about antiretroviral drug transfer is that whilst most drugs, most antiretrovirals can be measured in the plasma of the breastfed infant, I'm not aware of a single case of toxicity that seems to have resulted from that transmammary drug exposure. But it's not as simple as that, as that, of course, is it? There are some real factors of concern. And first and foremost is that the risk of HIV transmission through breastfeeding does not seem to be zero, even when the mother is virologically suppressed. It's very difficult to put a figure on that, but almost all of the bigger studies have shown the odd isolated case where the mother seems to have maintained virological suppression and transmission has occurred. The reason this happens, we believe, is because antiretrovirals suppress cell-free viral RNA. That's what we measure when we look at viral load. But in breast milk, there's also cell-associated DNA that does not suppress with treatment. And of course, breast milk is a very cellular matrix. So there is that risk. Not only that, but adherence can be very challenging postpartum. And that's been shown in almost every study. A large meta-analysis of more than 63,000 mothers showed adherence dropped to about 85%. And what we also know from some of the older PMTCT trials is that 
if an infant becomes HIV infected whilst the mother is on antiretrovirals, that infant has a very high risk of multi-class drug resistance. And the reason is that the infant plasma concentrations hover about that zone that selects out the resistance mutants. So whilst infection is a rare event, when it does happen, it can be quite devastating and difficult to treat. And perhaps a final question is, well, how much risk is acceptable? And who should make the final choice about this? So perhaps we should look at the guidance. Because of concerns about transmission, until 2016, all guidance from high income countries firmly prohibited breastfeeding to the point where it was a child protection issue. So a woman risked referral to social services if she was found to be secretly breastfeeding her baby. And yet we all knew it was happening. And what could be more dangerous than breastfeeding your baby without any clinical support or careful monitoring? And this was reflected in the 2017 European update that said if a woman insists on breastfeeding, she should be supported in that choice. The American guidelines followed not long after. They said that a woman should be given evidence-based information and then supported in her choice. Now, my difficulty with that is that we don't yet have all the evidence we really want and need to make a fully informed choice. The British guidelines, also in 2018, support choice if the mother is virologically suppressed and has good adherence. There have been no major adjustments to these guidelines since then, but it's worth noting that all of us across the world have experimented with all kinds of different models of care as a result of COVID. And I'll be fascinated to see how some of these models could potentially really benefit mothers who need a little bit more support than normal, but need to be able to access that discreetly. So changing models of care is something to watch. But as of today, there is no guideline from a high income country that recommends breastfeeding. They all say it should be recommended against the women should be told about the risk of transmission, but it should be discussed fully with the available evidence. A couple of small studies from high income countries yield a little bit of understanding of the context and the situation. So in the UK, the Pacify study showed that a third of childbearing women with HIV would actually like to breastfeed. The main driver of that seems to be the social cultural acceptability. Two thirds of them had been asked directly about why they were not breastfeeding and felt that they had to lie to make excuses about why that is. And for many cultures to bottle feed is basically disclosing your HIV status with all the harms that that can bring. But more worryingly, perhaps only about half of the women were worried about passing on HIV. And there seemed to be a little bit of confusion about the importance of virological suppression. So what this study emphasized was the need for clear communication from early on. And perhaps this overlaps with findings from Leila Haberl and their team in Germany, where they looked at the notes of 42 women they identified who had breastfed with HIV. All of the women were virologically suppressed at delivery, and two of them did have a blip during follow-up, at which point they stopped breastfeeding. There was quite a lot of variation in how long they fed for whether neonatal prep was used, but they found no infant transmissions. And they concluded that we really need to discuss this early in pregnancy. And their comment was that the German guidelines need to be improved and that the British ones were better. But drawing this all together, we must have our mothers at the center of care. What seems to be the most important thing is that she's on a regimen that she tolerates, she adheres to, and that achieves virological suppression. And that seems more important than any subtle differences between regimens. Patient-centered models of care are clearly important. We need more evidence to define best practice. And as I mentioned, it'll be interesting to see how these changing models of care might help these women in particular. The absolute numbers each cohort gets are going to be small. So if we're really going to understand this population, we need to share data between centers, both numerical data, but also learning experiences, models of care and so forth. And I'm sure that regimens that support adherence are likely to bring potential benefit. I really believe that long acting drugs, if we can study them in this population, might bring a substantial benefit. And that brings us back to the earlier discussion of risk and how much risk is considered acceptable. I'd like to invite any questions either now during the forum or my details are on the slide. I'm always happy for discussion on this area and thank you very much for your attention.